How many of you are aware of this phrase, up and at him? Have you heard of that before? A lot of you have. And I got curious about this because when I hear that, I think of maybe a dad or a mom going into their kid's bedroom to get them out of bed in the morning and say, up and at him. Or maybe there's someone that's goofing off at the job and the boss says, ah, no, 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 up and at him. But I did a little research on this phrase and it, and it doesn't come from any of those contexts. It's a military phrase. It's a phrase that a commander would use with the troops that are underneath his command to say, you need to get up, get at them, get moving. The enemy is coming. Go on the offensive. Up and at them. And I found that's pretty interesting because I said, you know what? In many ways, that's what the story of Jesus' resurrection is all about. Up and and Adam. Now, in this story, this wonderful story that we're looking at, the story of the resurrection here, yes, in a trip through time in the life of Christ, you need to be aware, and I need to be aware, that this story is the heart and the foundation of what we believe. If you take this story out of the mix, if you think it's not true, if you say it's a bunch of baloney, it's a myth in a bunch of other stories that may be true, but this one's a myth, what you do is you knock the legs out from everything that we believe and everything that we put our hope and trust in. This is it, folks. It really is. And we're going to look at that today. But in order to understand that, in order to make sense of the resurrection that Jesus performed on himself, we also need to know a little bit more about his death. You see, the first Adam came, and by his mess up, sin and death and all of this evil stuff came into the world like opening a big can of worms or Pandora's box. But Jesus is referred to in Scripture as the second Adam. Did you know that? And as the second Adam, he came, and when he rose from the dead, all of that stuff that came out of Pandora's box, sin, death, hell, devil, demons, Jesus put it all to shame because he triumphed over all of it. And that's why when we think about the Easter story, when we think about the resurrection, when we think about this day in general, people miss the mark by thinking it's all about hiding eggs for the kiddos or it's all about springtime fluff. That's not what this is about. Or about maybe chowing down on ham for dinner. No, this day is all about victory, victory, victory. Up and Adam, second Adam. That's what we're going to talk about today. But again, before we do that, we are going to have a little theology lesson. you got to be kidding me, you're thinking, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yes, a little theology lesson on the death of Jesus. And theologians refer to this, the meaning of it, as the atonement. Okay? If we're going to understand the victory, we have to understand why he died and what it means and what the implications are. It's very important. So we know Jesus came into this world, died on a cross. We understand that. And we know the story and we see movies about it. We hear all this scientific stuff about crucifixion and how horrible it was. And yes, we need to understand that. But sometimes I think we forget what does it mean? What are the implications? And, and theologians throughout the history have debated and had different ideas. Well, we think it means this. We think it means that. So we're going to look at some of the popular theories that are out there. Why did Jesus die? What did it mean when he died on the cross? And the first one we're going to talk about is this one called the moral exemplar theory. The moral exemplar theory. And that is some theologians have said that Jesus' death on the cross was basically a moral example to <laughs> compel humanity uh, to do what he did and stand up against injustice and the forces of evil 
and even at the point of death, you stand strong for what is right. Now, there's a truth in that. Yeah, Jesus did come into this world to minister and to serve, and he did set an example for us. 1 Corinthians 5.14 says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. So there's some truth into that, but if you leave it there, then if Jesus' death was only a moral example, that says nothing about how it relates to our sinful condition and how we can be saved. That's why many progressive Christian denominations, which we as a Bible-believing denomination would disagree with, they leave the atonement right here, and they stop. That's what the atonement's all about, just Jesus setting in a good example, and we need to do likewise. Several years back, there was a progressive denomination that wanted to use uh, Keith and Kristen Getty's wonderful, beautiful Easter song, In Christ Alone. We're going to sing that at our 1030 service. And um, they didn't agree, though, with what that song says about the atonement. If you're here at 1030 and you sing that song, it says, But on the cross as Jesus died... Uh, the wrath of God was satisfied. Remember those words? Well, this progressive denomination wanted to change the words to, but on the cross as Jesus died, the love of God exemplified. See, they were moral exemplar people, and they went to the Gettys, and they said, can we change your words in that song for our church? And the Gettys said, let us think about that. Uh, no. <laughs> and that was the right call. But even though that's not the all in all, Jesus' death was not merely a moral example and that's it. There is some implication that that is true. Jesus did set a good example. Sure he did. But it's not enough. Let's move on to another theory. And this one is the heart of what we believe as Bible-believing Christians, the substitutionary theory. What this means is Jesus' death on the cross, the atonement, is one in which God comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ, lives, ministers among us, and then dies in the cross on our place. We're the ones who are guilty of sin. We're the ones who are guilty of violating God's holy law. But rather than us have to face the punishment for our sin, Jesus took our place by dying on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 makes this clear, where it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Very important. It's the heart of what we believe. And we want to grasp onto that because, um, wow, if that didn't happen, if Jesus' death wasn't to do that, we're in a heap of trouble. But there's one more theory closely related to that that I would like us to consider today. And believe it or not, this one ties into the Easter story, the resurrection. And this one is called the Christus Victor theory, meaning Jesus Christ is victorious. This theory of the atonement, theologians say that Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection showed that he was victorious over all of those demonic and satanic powers, sin, the law, and death, and stomped on it, putting it under subjection to him. That was the purpose. Colossians 2.15, <coughs> I beg your pardon, says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, we sing about that. You remember the old hymn that we sing from time to time, I will sing of my Redeemer? Remember one of the phrases in that hymn is, I will sing of my Redeemer, his triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory he giveth over sin and death and hell. That's Christus Victor. Jesus is victorious. And even though that theory doesn't address, um, you know, how our sin specifically is forgiven like the substitutionary theory, it, it still holds weight and there's truth in that. Yes, of course, Jesus was victorious over sin and death and hell. And on that note, if you can remember that, Christ is victorious, Christus victor. Now, finally, 
If you're wondering when are you going to get to it, we get to the Easter story. And we're going to be reading the Easter story, the resurrection, which appears in all four Gospels, because it's so important. In Matthew chapter, or I beg your pardon, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And uh, later today, if you'd like, you can read it from Matthew 28, Luke 24, Luke tw or John 20. Feel free to make note of those and look at the differences in terms of the different aspects that the Holy Spirit inspired those authors to bring out. But uh, we're going to look at Mark's uh, uh, gospel today, and we're going to invite you to turn there now. Please feel free to find it in your own Bibles. You can pull it up on a phone or an app uh, on your uh, tablet, I guess, or it can be found on page 1014 of your pew Bibles. Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. Let's read the Easter story now. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, as we look at this story, there's a number of different ways you can look at it. And sorry, ladies, I hope that none of you ladies will get up and walk out. But what we're going to do is look at the actions of the ladies in this story and, frankly, the mistakes they made. Yikes. Um, this is not to insult you or to insult womankind, but we can learn from it. This is not chauvinism. This is just what happened on that day. Now, some background information, if you are curious why these ladies are headed to the tomb. Well, Jesus embalming, according to John chapter 19, after his death, was done in a very hasty but yet lavish manner. They did it quickly because the Sabbath was approaching. That is, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who arranged for all this. So apparently these women are going to uh, do maybe a better job. Let's get this thing right. Let's make it look a little better here. He deserves a good embalming. And okay, that's fine. But that in itself is a mistake, isn't it? Mistake number one in verses one to two that these ladies made is being zealous to serve a dead Jesus. Three of these ladies, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James, probably the, referring to James the Lesser there, James, uh, James son of Alphaeus, his mother was named Mary, and Salome, uh, they could finally buy spices and uh, get the, uh, finish the job. And uh, that's probably, uh, we're talking about Saturday night, now it's early Sunday morning. In verse 2, around sunrise, they take off for the tomb, and they're expecting to find a dead Jesus. But we are talking about a victorious Jesus. A victorious Jesus is not a dead Jesus. A victorious Jesus is going to do exactly what he said he would do in Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 32. He told his disciples and others that, yeah, he, he's going to raise from the dead. Look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 30. It says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to the disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, 
and were afraid to ask him. Now, I'm a little bit sympathetic to the ladies, maybe to let them off the hook here, because I never thought of this before. Um, they still made a mistake, but when you look at the different passages, and I scoured for all of them that I could, where Jesus said or hinted at the fact that he was going to raise from the dead, when he prophesied this or predicted it in the Gospels, it looks like he was speaking primarily to groups of men. The 12 disciples, the, the Jewish leaders, guys like that. I'm not saying that, that the Bible says no women ever heard of this. We don't know that. That's an argument from silence. The point is the, the idea of Jesus saying, guys, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to raise from the dead. He mainly told that to the men. So maybe these men, like guys often do, don't talk much in front of women. I don't know. That's just a joke for this morning. It doesn't matter. Anyway, regardless of whether they heard it firsthand or the men did tell them or they didn't know or they just heard it indirectly, it still was a mistake. We want to put our faith and trust in a living Jesus. Romans 10 and verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we don't serve a dead Jesus. We serve a victorious Jesus, Christus Victor. Mistake number two. The second mistake they made is being concerned about an obstacle. In verses three and four, the ladies are saying, well, who's going to roll away that rock from the entrance to the tomb? And um, yeah, that would be a pretty legitimate concern. Um, talk to those folks that went to Israel with Dr. Craig, if you can grab one of them. And um, what I'm told, I did not see it, but by researching this, that many of the tombs that were there in uh, ancient Israel, they were carved into the sides of hills and kept closed by a stone uh, that was rolled on a wheel, a perfect really round stone that was like rolled um, in a track to roll in front of this, the tomb entrance to keep it shut. And um, these uh, rolling stones, if you will, ha uh ha, -huh, that's more humor, uh, weighed, weighed uh, literally a ton or two, two to 4,000 pounds. So um, yeah, th three men, let alone three ladies, trying to get that open, that would be a tall order. But verse four, they get there and surprise, um, it's already taken care of. That one to two ton stone is rolled back because it's no problem for God. It's no problem for the victorious Christ if he's going to raise from the dead to get that rock out of the way. Jeremiah 32 and verse 17, the prophet Jeremiah says, Ah, oh, Lord God, you have made the heavens by your great power. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too difficult for God. Ephesians 1 19 to 20, and I'm going to turn there so that I quote it for you correctly and do not mess it up. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul said the following, and this is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Power. Our victorious Christ is powerful. Indeed he is. Third mistake. Here we go. S sorry, ladies. This is almost over with now. All the mistakes the women are making. The third thing is being afraid in verses 5 through 8. They enter the tomb in verse 5. And there's a guy there in a white robe. And we have an angel there. And it says they're alarmed or astonished, depending on what version you're using. According to the scholars of the ancient Greek, the word literally means um, to, let me get this right, the Greek means so amazing that it almost scares you. Okay? Shocking is probably a good word there. And the young man, and the young man says to, uh, to these ladies, you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene? He's not here. See the place where they laid him? He's risen. He's not here. He's Christus Victorious. This is up and Adam, second Adam at its 
best. The angel tells these women four things. One, don't be alarmed. Number two, I want you to see where they laid him. Number three, I want you to go. And four, tell Jesus' disciples and Peter that he's going on to Galilee. Okay? Now, notice that one of those commands was, don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed. Don't be shocked. Well, how did the women react to this in verse 8? It says they were trembling and they had fear. They were trembling with fear. That's their reaction. And I wanted to be careful about this. Well, what's the fear they had? Were they just maybe still shocked or, you know, amazed and whatever that other word meant, you know, amazed that it almost scares you, but they're not really scared. No, the word there in verse eight describing their fear is the word phobos, where we get the word phobia. It's real fear. Now, some might say, you know, well, maybe they just were in awe of what was going on and they had the fear of the Lord. I mean, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? But no, that's probably not what's going on. The fear of the Lord is an ah, is what we need to do. But the fear of the Lord is an ah, that's not the fear of the Lord that we're to have, and certainly not in this case. This is a time for excitement. This is a time for joy. You heard in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning in our call to worship, Verses 55 to 57. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't want to make those mistakes. We don't want to believe that the resurrection isn't true, that we serve a dead Jesus. We don't want to think that he's not powerful enough to deal with the obstacles. And we certainly don't want to run around in fear for some reason. Fear of the Lord, yes, is in respect, but not that kind of fear that they had. What we want to do is to focus on the fact that the message of Jesus Christ is up and Adam, second Adam, he is victorious. He has secured the victory, and that victory is going to continue on through the end of time. Now, Having said that, in closing this all up, some of you might say, I understand the story, I've heard this many times before, but you have no idea how hard it is for me right now to get excited about Jesus' victory and say up and Adam, second Adam and all that, when because of what I've dealt with recently in my life, I just want to crawl in a hole. I miss my loved one who died. It's hard to be afraid, not to be afraid. It's hard not to be afraid knowing that I'm facing an illness that could kill me. It's hard to think about victory when I have all of these problems and I can't stop feeling defeated. And you know what? That's very understandable. But let me challenge you with this. What side do you want to be on knowing that you're facing all of these problems? Do you want to be on the winning side? Or the losing side? Do you want Christ on your side who is victorious? Or do you want to be on the side of the evil one whose doom is sure? Having the victorious Christ on your side, he will never leave you or forsake you even in those darkest moments. Whereas the evil one, he will exploit the darkest times in your life because he's all about stealing and killing and destroying. Having the victorious Christ on your side, you will see everything work out, not the way that you want it to, but he's going to work all things out for your good since you love him and are called according to your purpose. The evil one? No. Again, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. Having the risen and victorious Christ on your side, you have the knowledge that he is and always will be victorious. The mission is and always will be up in Adam, second Adam, and that God's, God's mission all the way to the end is that death and hell and evil will be destroyed in the lake of fire someday, and our eternal dwelling will be 
with him. So yes, with all due respect to many of you who have had a rough week, a rough month, a rough year, maybe even a rough life, it still is important and it always is important to realize that yes, Jesus is risen. He is Christus Victor. And in the end, everything is going to be just fine because the message is, was, and always will be up and Adam, second Adam. He is victorious. Amen and amen.